as artists isn't about appeasing the crowd. Rather, it's about tending to the broken parts inside of ourselves. We create things as a reflection of this struggle to study our perception of self. necessarily a thing you achieve. Rather, it is a state of mind which you constantly strive toward. This all comes from an understanding that ideas aren't static, but fluid, like water. Be like water. Sound? Is the sound working? Can you hear the words that I am saying? Uh, anything? I'm trying all audio sources here. You have audio now? Okay. I apologize for the chaos uh, of me getting started today. Um, <clears throat> last minute change in the program for today. Um, so, uh, yeah. Let me, uh, let me do uh, my intro and then um, we'll talk a little bit about the change that happened and what the plan is for today. So today on Archival Adventures, we are gonna be looking at the Michael Collins papers instead of the Hokie Pride records. Um, we will look at Hokie Pride next week, uh, but if you haven't seen the news, um, it came out uh, in about the last hour that astronaut Michael Collins uh, passed away at the age of 90. Michael Collins was part of the Apollo 11 mission uh, with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Um, his papers are housed here at Virginia Tech, and so instead of Hokie Pride, um, we are going to look at the Michael Collins papers today, and we will look at Hokie Pride next week. Um, before we dive into that, I do have a couple of acknowledgments that I want to go through. Uh, we acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. <clears throat> okay. Um, so... Oh no, is that, is that now? 16-bit Eric uh, Whimsies, welcome, welcome to Archival Adventures, <laughs> um, all 47 of you. Uh, so I had a mad dash the last half hour to run around and completely change the content for today's stream. Um, today, we were going to be looking at the records of Hokie Pride, which is the Virginia Tech student LGBTQ plus group. Um, instead, we are going to be looking at the Michael Collins papers. Uh, Michael Collins was the third astronaut on the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin went down in the lunar lander. Michael Collins stayed in the orbiter. Um, and his papers are here at Virginia Tech. And so... Um, a half hour before we went live today, 
I decided to switch out and we are going to highlight the Michael Collins papers today um, and take a look at uh, everything that he had donated to Virginia Tech, uh, which includes materials from the Apollo 11 mission. Um, so I hope that will be interesting for you all. Um, that is the plan. Uh, let me go ahead and say hello to everybody that came in. Um, first, I want to say welcome to, um, I believe I saw Hannah. Hannah, welcome. Uh, Growing Toward the Sun. Um, uh, 16-bit Eric, of course, absolutely. Thank you so much for the raid. Uh, Wraith Fay, Lord Portico, Okashi, uh, Geek Outs, Vance, um, Orangitis, Ralph Exiv, uh, Beth, uh, welcome everybody in. Oh, and Wraith Fay, thank you for the 200 bits. Scribbler Gaming, welcome. Um, yes, so today, um, the normal technical support that I have was not here, so I was scrambling to get all of everything working for today, and then at the last minute changed what the plan is. So things are here, and hopefully they work. Um, I don't know if you can hear the music. If it's too loud, let me know. I can, I can turn it down. Hopefully captions are on. I am going to try and switch over so that we can see um, the description of the Michael Collins papers. I'm juggling a, a few things right now and I'm a little bit flustered, but we'll, we will get it. Um, Can you hear me now? Am I audible again? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so for some reason, my lav mic is not working today, and I don't know what's causing that. Uh, I'm using the overhead mics in the room, um, which are different. So, <laughs> um, like I said, the normal people who come in and set up the equipment before I get here aren't here today, and so um, it was me and a student worker trying to figure out how to get everything set up. Clearly we didn't get everything exactly right, but as long as it's functional, then we will go with it. <laughs> um, okay, so Finding Aid is here for the Michael Collins papers. Um, the cover time period from 1907 to 2004, unsurprisingly, the most uh, sought after period of that is um, the Apollo missions uh, for most people that are wanting to use them. We do have some of this material online. I'm going to open that link in another tab. Um, so this collection includes the papers of Michael Collins, pilot, astronaut, assistant secretary of state, director of the National Air and Space Museum, and author, dating from 1907 to 2004, including reports, instruction manuals, person, personal notes, printed materials, audio recordings, photographs, awards and memorabilia associated with Collins, um, Collins' Air Force, NASA, State Department, and National Air and Space Museum careers, also papers and research relating to his writings, materials from public speaking engagements, and board and club memberships. Small, se small sets of personal correspondence and biographical material. <laughs> um, the, uh, Kira has dropped in the chat links to the finding aids, so um, you're welcome to peruse it. Uh, I will read out the biographical note for you, and then we'll take a look at just um, a little bit of overview of what's in the collection. And then I have most of the collection here. I didn't manage to fit everything on a cart, so there are a couple boxes I don't have in the room with me. But otherwise, if you see something that you're interested in, feel free to drop it in chat, and I will make an effort to um, showcase it on stream. 
Um, <clears throat> Michael Collins, pilot, astronaut, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, National Air and Space Museum director and author, was born in Rome, Italy on October 31st, 1930. He graduated from, from St. Albans School in D.C. before attending the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, uh, where he obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in 1952. He received an Air Force commission and, after pilot training, was assigned to Nellis Air Base for advanced training on the F-86 Sabre Jet. Um, I got distracted by chat for a second, sorry. Upon completion of training, he was assigned to the 21st Fighter Bomber Wing, stationed in Victorville, California, and later France. In 1961, Collins completed test pilot school and was assigned to Edwards Air Force Base, where he tested experimental fighter jets. Uh, in the meantime, he had married Patricia Finnegan. The couple would have three children, Kathleen, Anne, and Michael. Interested in NASA's manned space program, Collins enrolled in the newly established Aerospace Pilot School in 1963. In October of that year, he was among the third group of astronauts selected by NASA. Collins served as a member of the backup crew for the Gemini 7 mission and as pilot of NASA's Gemini 10 mission, launched July 18, 1966, with Commander John Young. Among the mission's noteworthy accomplishments were the establishment of a new orbital altitude rock record, a rendezvous with, the, with an Agena target vehicle, and two spacewalks conducted by Collins. Due to the rotational basis on which astronauts were assigned to Apollo missions, he was originally scheduled to be a member of the Apollo 8 flight crew, but his, he needed back surgery, so he was reassigned to a later mission, uh, which ultimately put him on the crew of Apollo 11, the first manned mission to land on the lunar surface. As the command module pilot, he orbited the moon while Commander Neil Armstrong and lunar module pilot Buzz Aldrin descended to its surface. So he was the first human to be fully out of contact with the Earth when he was orbiting around the back of the moon. Um, for that period of time, he had no contact with any other humans. He couldn't reach uh, Armstrong or Aldrin on the surface of the moon. He couldn't communicate with Houston. He was in radio blackout. And for the entirety of his transit behind the moon was fully out of contact with all other humans. Um, in January 1970, he resigned from NASA and served as Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs before becoming the first director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in April 1971. He was promoted to Undersecretary of the Smithsonian in April 1978. During this time, he began writing about his experiences in the space program, leading to his book, Carrying the Fire, and a subsequent children's adaptation, Flying to the Moon and Other Strange Places. His expertise and talents led to numerous requests for speaking engagements, articles, and book reviews. In 1988, he published Lift Off, a book on the history and future of space exploration. His Mission to Mars was published in 1990 served on the boards of numerous organizations and corporations throughout the 70s and 80s, became vice president of field operations for the Vought Corporation in 1980, then resigned to head his own consulting firm, Michael Collins Associates, in 1985. Retired from the Air Force Reserve with the rank of Major General in 1982. Awards include Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Collier, Harmon, and Goddard Trophies, the Air Force Distinguished Medal, D Distin the Air Force Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and many others. He's received awards from 11 other countries and honorary degrees from six colleges and universities. Whew. I'm just going to take a breath for a second and get a sip of water. And so, as I said, um, news did come out in about the last hour that he had passed away. I have the Washington Post article up here. Um, I have not fully read it. I saw the news that he had passed and so haven't looked to see exactly what his passing was attributed to, but he was 90 years old, so it's not exactly surprising that he would uh, pass on. Um, the papers that we have cover a, a large range of his 
life. Uh, thank you, Kira. According to Kira, um, he did pass from cancer. Um, <clears throat> so we have correspondence notes, printed material, photographs, and audio recordings from his career, um, training at the U.S. Test Pilot School, Experimental Flight Center, participation in Gemini and Apollo programs, tenure at the State Department and the Air and Space Museum. Also includes materials related to his books. So... Um, the boxes that I have, I pulled basically everything from box one to box 23, and then I have boxes 32, 33, and 34 as well. Uh, so we have quite a few boxes, more than we could ever look at today. Um, you can see here the different series included in the collection are Air Force, Project Gemini, Project Apollo. Assistant Secretary of State, National Air and Space Museum, boards and clubs, writings, speeches, personal correspondence, biographical materials, and honors and memorabilia. Um, so, I think I'm just going to switch over and start with boxes. As I said, if there is something on the finding aid that you're particularly interested in seeing, do let me know and I will make, a, make it a priority to try and feature that on stream. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to start pulling box by box and we'll see what's in there um, because that has been kind of the format of this program. I may lose sound again when I switch, so um, one second. Well, and I didn't just lose sound, I lost, uh, oh heck. We're going to make it work. <laughs> um... Forgive the technical difficulties. I think that should work now. Boxes six and something. Is that supposed to be an eight? Seven. Six and seven are amazing. Okay, I will start with boxes six and seven then. Um, I'm actually going to adjust the camera just slightly first. One second. and seven. That is where we will start. Uh, very, very frazzled today. I'm very sorry. Uh, but thank you all for bearing with me while I've been uh, going through this. Um, getting messaged. Michael Collins papers. The first item here. Hopefully, oh, let me out of focus. So I'm not sure how easily you can read that. Uh, the handwriting there is slightly difficult to read, even for me in person. It says, NASA photographs, black and white, 1966, no date, one of three, box six, folder 1A. Uh, since I have a feeling these are going to be glossy photos, I'm going to go ahead and put on gloves, uh, which are not part of 
our normal attire for dealing with with most of the archival materials that we have, but for glossy photographs, the oils on my skin can ultimately damage them. Um, whereas for a lot of old paper stuff, oh, they're in sleeves. Well, then I don't need the gloves. But um, for a lot of old paper stuff, the gloves can actually catch the paper and tear it, so it's less damaging to just go barehanded. But, since these are in sleeves, I have a feeling they're in sleeves because these get shown, or people come in and look at these quite a lot. This is one of our more, um, more viewed collections. So here's the first photograph. Uh, sadly, there's glare, and I, I can try and adjust by angling. Try and get rid of some of the glare. Ooh, I have wedged foam. That might help me to angle it so that I don't get glare. Ha ha! Semi-successful! <laughs> um, so here you can see posed in space suits next to a globe. Um, it appears... I don't know... So there are words on the back of it. Manned, space manned spacecraft center. I'm, I'm reading in between. There are two photos in here. I'm just kind of bending it open so I can read what it says. Um, it's mimeographed on the back. Uh, black and white portrait, July 66. It says July 6, 66, Cape Kennedy, Florida. Gemini 10 crew, the prime crew of the National... Aeronautics and Space Administration Gemini 10 Space Flight Astronauts John W. Young Wright, Command Pilot, and Michael Collins, Pilot. So, <clears throat> Michael Collins is the person on the left in this photo. The other photograph here, let me read it first if I can, and then I will show it. Uh, Cape Kennedy, Florida, Gemini 10 astronauts, left to right, John W. Young, command pilot, and Michael Collins, pilot, are in the Gemini 10 spacecraft during the simultaneous launch demonstration at the White Room level at Complex 19, Cape Kennedy, Florida, in preparation for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Gemini 10 mission. The primary mission objective is successful rendezvous and docking of the Gemini 10 spacecraft with the Agena 10 target vehicle. So here, <clears throat> Michael Collins is the person on the right, uh, but they are in the Gemini 10 spacecraft. It is fully black and white. You're getting a little bit of a green hue to it, and that, I think, is because the wall behind me is green screen green. Um, and so it's getting a little bit of reflection from the wall. But if I angle it up, you get glare. So they'll be slightly greenish black and white photos. Next up, we have two more photographs. Let's see what they are. Cape Kennedy, Florida. The erector is being lowered at Complex 19 during a range frequency test in preparation for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Gemini 10 three-day Earth orbital mission. The Gemini spacecraft stopped the Titan II booster, oh, atop the Titan II booster, has a protective covering. Gemini 10 astronauts John W. Young, command pilot, and Michael Collins, pilot, are scheduled to make the space flight. And the other one, I'll read the description and then we'll look at the photos. Uh, Cape Kennedy, Florida, the backup crew uh, for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Gemini 10 mission, Clifton W. Willame, uh, William, sorry, Clifton C. Williams, Jr., pilot, 
and Alan L. Bean, command pilot, are at the white room level of Complex 19 for a checkout in the Gemini 10 spacecraft. NASA plans a three-day Earth orbital mission for Gemini 10 to rendezvous and dock with the Agena 10 target vehicle. So, first, it's the Gemini 10 on the launch platform. And then the backup crew on, at, on the white level uh, getting a checkout. <clears throat> and I am by no means an expert on uh, NASA or Apollo 11 or the Gemini missions, but if you have questions, um, Feel free to ask them. I will do my best to provide any answers that are in the materials I have available, or possibly um, Kira will be able to locate and provide some answers. Um, these are collections that we've had for quite a while, and so we do get questions about them. We get researchers that come in and do research. Um, for the 40th anniversary, was it 40th? 50th, 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, um, 50th, uh, we did a, a fairly large exhibit that included many of these materials, um, and then uh, just this past January we did, uh, the, it was the anniversary of Apollo 14, and so we had an exhibit up for that as well. Um, because we also have materials from some of those astronauts. Um, but also, I... Th no, it wasn't Collins that... Yeah, we have a, a couple of collections, um, because uh, I'm going to forget the name, Kira, so please remind me of the name. Um, one of the people who worked at NASA during the Apollo missions, who was ground control for the Apollo 11 mission and the Apollo 14 mission, thank you, Christopher Kraft, um, was an alum of Virginia Tech and encouraged uh, others who were at NASA during that time period to donate their papers here to Virginia Tech. Um, and so because of that, we have a number of materials here. Um, and Virginia Tech and kind of rural Virginia um, had an active NASA facility during that time period, um, if anyone has seen, there's a movie, um, oh shoot, my brain is not going to give me the name of this movie either, um, a movie about the black women that were involved in working at NASA at the time. Um, Kira, if you can remember that, uh, Anyway, in that movie, they're, they're located at the NASA facilities in Virginia. Um, and I wish I could recall the name of the movie. If anybody remembers it, uh, please do remind me. Um, it's just, whenever I need names of things and I'm trying to do them off the top of my head, they flee from my brain. Uh, all right, we have Gemini 10 astronauts Michael Collins and John Young. Suited up during a simultaneous launch demonstration. Hidden Figures. Thank you, Kira. <laughs> uh, so the Hidden Figures movie um, is set at NASA facilities in Virginia um, that are not all that far from where we are here. Uh, that one I can't read. But... Um, We'll just show off the photos. So this is, uh, this is them getting checked out. You can see that's a relatively small computer for the time uh, behind them there. Um, it doesn't take up the entire room. It's only like four units. <laughs> 
And I see uh, Philip also gave me the name of Hidden Figures. I don't know why. I tried. I, I'm like, I know exactly what the movie is. I've seen it multiple times. I know the plot and could tell it to you. But I couldn't remember the name of it. Um, so lots of very interesting photography here. I wish... I don't know what's exactly going on in the photo that you can see right now because the back, the mimeographed typing on the back is a little bit too um, faded. I can't actually read it. The next one, not faded. Uh, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Joe Schmidt, suit technician, briefs the rescue team for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Gemini 10 mission. Schmidt is showing the crew how a heel of an astronaut's boot is shaped and what is required if the astronauts have to have to be gotten out of the spacecraft in an emergency. Demonstration is part of a briefing for the rescue teams who will be on standby during the countdown and launch at Cape Kennedy. Air Force pararescue units and marine demolition team swimmers will be aboard helicopters, boats, and amphibious landing craft in readiness for a launch site abort. So that is this photograph here, showing off how the boot looks, how it functions, what's required to extract them from the spacecraft. Um, so while we did have Three people go up, two of them actually set foot on the moon. Um, it's an entire team. Oh. These are oriented in a way that I can't really read them. But we will look at them anyway. Uh, we have one of the rockets actually launching in this photograph. <clears throat> Here's the Gemini 10 spacecraft with some people inside. And that's really, like, that's all the space they have in this module. It's very cramped in there. They basically have enough space to get themselves inside and pull it closed. Which just is amazing to me. Like, I, I'm not claustrophobic. I don't really have a problem with heights or darkness or any of that. I would not want to go into space in that thing. <laughs> Is that, I wonder if that is the airplane? I'm gonna see if I can read the caption. Um, Zero G Michael Collins practices leaving and re-entering a mock-up spacecraft under weightless conditions in preparations for his spacewalk on the upcoming Gemini 10 mission. So uh, yeah, I do think this is the the jet, I believe, I've heard it called the Vomit Comet. Um, I don't remember the actual technical name for it. But the jet that goes up and just simulates free fall for them or gives them a few minutes of, of weightlessness um, to get practice with it. This next one, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Gemini 10 Spacecraft Erection Launch Complex, 19 Cape Kennedy, the three-day Gemini 10 mission with astronauts John W. Young, command pilot, and Michael Collins, pilot, will cover a varied scope, uh, including spacecraft rendezvous and docking. That's all it says. It doesn't really say too much about what's specifically in the photograph. 
And then the other one is Weightlessness Training with Astronaut Michael Collins. So here is the Gemini spacecraft all wrapped up like a little present. That's the whole craft. Really not too much bigger than the people standing behind it on that gantry. <clears throat> and this is the photograph of Michael Collins doing weightlessness training. And just as a reminder for anybody who may have shown up recently, um, we are looking at the Michael Collins papers today. Uh, Michael Collins was the third astronaut on the Apollo 11 mission, um, the mission that landed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. Uh, Michael Collins stayed in the orbiter while um, Armstrong and Aldrin descended to the moon. Um, he passed away earlier today, or was it was announced he had passed away earlier today. Uh, and so we are highlighting his papers here on the stream today. Next up we have the Gemini 10 News Conference with astronauts John Young on the left and Michael Collins on the right. Um, and then, then we will look at John Young watching Michael Collins preparing for his spacewalk. So here we have the news conference. John Young on the left, Michael Collins on the right. This is the Gemini 10 news conference. And then here, they're with the orbiter, or they're, they're with the Gemini 10 spacecraft, and Michael Collins is practicing for his spacewalk. Uh, I believe we read at the beginning that he had done two spacewalks as part of the Gemini 10 mission. Again, we have one that I cannot read, and then we have the Gemini 11 second stage booster being unloaded at Cape Kennedy, Florida. Um, the one I can't read is the Gemini 10, it's clearly a, a photograph of the Gemini 10 mission patch. Uh, I can't read what the caption is, but they tend to just be very uh, met matter-of-fact captions, so it's probably just identifying it as the Gemini 10 mission patch. And then this is the Gemini 11 booster rocket being loaded. The next ones we'll see are Gemini 10 astronaut John Young that's it it's just a photograph of John Young and then uh, Gemini 10 astronaut Michael Collins and that's all the oh it says uh, photographed through the spacecraft window at the white room John Young. He's in the space suit. And he does look really young. <laughs> I know, I know Young is just his name, but 
looking at them in these photographs, they look very young. I guess so much of my exposure to NASA and to these programs was well after they happened. Um, and so they were all just these old people <laughs> who had gone into space at some time in the past. Um, but looking at their photographs now, they were really young when they did this. So that is the first of these packets of photographs that Kira pointed us to. Again, if there's something specific in the um, finding aid that sounds interesting to you and you'd like me to pull out and highlight, do let me know and I will make an effort to highlight it on stream. <coughs> I'm going to pull out folder two. Oh no! Hannah! <laughs> I'm sorry that I freaked you out uh, by still being talking on stream uh, when you got back. Um, this is actually folder 16, so I'm uncertain if they're just numbered strangely or but it's the next one in the box. It's folder 16. Um, let's see if I've got descriptions on the back that I can read of these. Because I find it's lovely to actually know what I'm looking at with these. All right, Gemini 10, again, Michael Collins and John Young. Uh, examine experiments that they're to carry aboard their spacecraft. So that'll be the first one we look at. And then they pause at Cape Kennedy during one of their many practice mission simulations prior to their Gemini 10 flight. So here they are looking at the experiments that they're going to be carrying out on the Gemini 10. And so the, the person in the foreground there, the person with the badge around his neck, actually like holding the items is Michael Collins. Um, and then the person, the second person, uh, here is John Young, um, who were the two, two crew people on Gemini 10. Let's see what we have here. Um, attend a briefing on spacecraft stowage procedures two days before their flight. And then a weather photograph used to check on storm conditions a few days prior to Gemini 10. Um, oh, sorry, we have them in their, in their space suits preparing for the mission. Young on the left and Collins on the right. Here they are. I've already forgotten what I read that they were doing here. Uh, it was something about pausing while they were examining stuff. Uh, and this is the weather photograph taken from a weather satellite to check on storm conditions prior to their launch. I do see that it is about halfway through our stream and we have done 
basically just photographs, which is not a bad thing, but I am going to probably speed through these a little bit faster so that we can look at some other stuff. Um, so far we've only been looking at Gemini 10 material, um, and I would like to get to some of the Apollo 11 stuff. Um, Kira, if you have suggestions for other boxes that I should pull out, show off, etc., I would be happy for suggestions. Um, let's see, I think this is meant to go this way. <clears throat> I do have 32, 33, and 34, which I think are objects. although I'm not sure what they are, um, but we can look at them in a minute. <clears throat> so these would have been, these images here would have been, uh, actually all of these were meant for, um, for potential use by press in covering the missions. Um, but these illustrations, especially with the, um, the showing off the actual rockets and what they would look like in space. Um, I don't believe they're actual photographs. They're like, that's an illustration clearly. And it's meant to show here's the rocket. Here's the, the module that the astronauts are going to be in. And it illustrates the two, um, orbits of the earth that they would take on the mission. <laughs> Akademian, I am uh, very happy to see that this is feeding your history and science itches. Um, these are some of the most interesting collections for me that we have. I don't, they, they're not within like the primary focus of the work that I do as an archivist here, but um, every time that I get a chance to actually work with them, I'm just continually impressed. Uh, they are some of my favorite collections that we have here. Um, and Michael Collins is one of a few that we have. And um, Kira did drop into chat there for you a link to the digitized material that we have. Um, the full collection hasn't been digitized, but proportions of it have. Uh, <laughs> um, Academian, uh, Becoming an archivist takes a little bit of work, but, you know, it, it can be very rewarding. If you are interested in historical documents at all, um, it's definitely a career that is worth pursuing. Um, we don't often get to just sit down and look through collections like this. Um, this show helps me share things with the world, but also gives me a chance to actually see some of the materials that we have. So much of our work actually involves just trying to describe what we have, which I might get to glance at something for a couple of minutes just to get a sense of what's there, and then I move on um, so that I can write up a description of what we have and things like that. I don't really get to go really in depth with the materials quite often. Um, one of the things I enjoy about the job, though, is when I get to do exhibits, because then I do get to dig into what we've got, um, find kind of the more interesting pieces, and then um, write up short descriptions so that I can share them with other people, which I really, really enjoy doing. Um, for this show, I even do less than that. I have not had the chance to sit down and really research the materials and be able to give a concise description of them. A lot of times on this show, I'm encountering them for the first time when I'm sharing them with you all. Um, and so I'm just kind of digging through what's there. Um, I've got the finding aid if I want to refer to it as a guide to find out what might be interesting to look at. But oftentimes I just sit down in front of the camera, pull out a box, 
open it up and we see what's there. Um, which I found has been a really rewarding way to structure this program. So it looks like Kira is telling me that box eight, folder one or two, um, might be interesting. It includes the Apollo training notebooks. So I think we will go for that. Um, <laughs> it's like a birthday. Yeah, it, it is. It's a lot of fun for me to be able to explore our collections in this way. And I'm definitely more familiar with what we have um, thanks to doing this. Um, today was less planned than normal. Uh, this was not the collection I had planned to share today. Box eight. But uh, current events happened. <laughs> um, Academian, for this stream, I stream once a week, Wednesdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time uh, until 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So, um, yeah, every Wednesday, 2.30 to 4.30 Eastern. Um, and I dual stream this on my personal channel, which is the one that you're on right now, as well as over on the VTUL Studios channel, which is the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel. Um, and yeah, so once a week, I pull out a new collection and we take a look at it. This week, we were supposed to be looking at the um, Hokey Pride collection. Oh, Academia. <laughs> Thank you so much for the tier one subscription. Uh, welcome to the ropes gallery. Um, yeah, this week we were gonna be looking at the Hokie Pride records, which is uh, records from the student LGBTQ plus group here at Virginia Tech. But then um, about a half hour before I went live, it uh, was announced in the news that Michael Collins um, had passed away uh, Michael Collins was the third astronaut on the Apollo 11 mission. Um, NPR's article calls him the forgotten astronaut. Um, so while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were down on the surface of the moon, Michael Collins remained in the lunar orbiter. Um, and once I saw that he had passed away, I knew that I needed to, if I could possibly make it work for this week, that I should switch um, the focus of today's stream uh, to his materials because we do have them here at the archives at Virginia Tech. So this is the Apollo training notebook for 1966 and 1967. Um, we just have the pages from the interior and you can see they are just regular kind of college-ruled note paper that were in, it looks like they were in some sort of three-ring binder at some point. Um, don't put two inverters on same line. Remove first inverter before putting on second. Sequential. See handout. So these look like his personal notes while he was training for the Apollo mission. See if I can zoom in a little bit here. I'm attempting to not zoom in too far, which I tend to do. Uh, all right, EPS. Eight EPS radiator, radiator panels to cool fuel cells with separate glycol system located on fairing between CM and SM, three inverters in LEB. I don't know what the abbreviations all mean personally. Three entry and post landing batteries, A, B, and C, two pyro batteries, A and B, vented into CM, battery vent line through 
through urine overboard line, normally open. If that, like, these are literal, like, these are his training notebooks from the Apollo mission. I think it's really, really cool. Also, much more organized than any notes that I have ever taken in my entire life. S-band antenna. S-band high gain antenna is mechanically displayed or deployed when SLA panels open between SC minus Y and plus Z axes. S-band omni, four antennas, flush on CM. VHF antennas, two scimitars on SM. See what else do we have in here? Lots of technical notes. R E N D. M four phonocardiogram. M five A bioassay body fluids. M six A bone demineralization, calcium balance studies, cytogenic blood studies, ergometer. Metabolic rate measurements, terrain, weather, zero-g single human cell, trapped particle asymmetry, interesting. There's really a wealth of information here. If somebody was wanting to do detailed research on how things were prepared uh, for the mission, like how, how they trained. He's got a lot in his notes. Flight plan. Like, I don't know what all of it means, but I think if you spent enough time with the collection, um, with the printed materials that are here, the technical manuals that are included, um, and then you would be able to refer back to these handwritten training notes and actually understand what he's taking notes about, what he thought was important or difficult to remember, um, and would be able to really focus in and write about that type of thing. The like some of the abbreviations here don't mean anything to me at this point because I don't know enough about the makeup of the machines, like the, the actual um, launch vehicles, the orbiter, the, the actual technology that he would need to be learning about. Um, I don't know enough about it. But we do have, as part of the collection, we have copies of technical manuals. We have things like that that are open and available for research because they've been declassified. Um, and so it would be possible to look at those and actually figure out what it was he was taking notes on, um, what it was he thought were, was important or interesting, um, or possibly difficult to understand and needed to be noted. Um, I would... I would be speculating to say, you know, which case it was, uh, whether these were things that were just really important or things that he kept forgetting and wanted to take notes on, or I don't know. So this is the actual instrument panel diagram. I think I'm upside down. Hang on. Yeah, I had it upside down. Instrument panel diagram. Which I will show you close up. I was just... He's got some notes written on here. Uh, secondary rad tool E. CCW to bypass. Uh, 
on vertical. There's a notation here uh, pointing to this number one here. Missing from CMS, is it in 102? Question mark. And then yes, underline. And for all, like, all of this stuff is really, really detailed, but it also makes perfect sense that it would be because these people were going into space and their lives depended on this machinery. So wanting to know everything about it and everything about how it operates, absolutely, they needed to be 100% familiar with this material. Um, because if something went wrong, there's a communication delay between the moon and the earth and they needed to know enough about these machines to be able to respond to malfunctions and emergencies themselves if necessary. If it was something critical, they needed to be able to respond to it without having to wait for instructions from the ground. So they had to be not just pilots, but engineers. Um, they were also expected to do scientific experiments while they were up there. So they had to be trained on those. Um, the people who were going to the surface of the moon, uh, especially, which any of them could have been the ones actually going to the surface. So all of the Apollo program pilots um, had to be trained on what the ground mission would be on the moon, which included geology, um, included uh, actually learning about topographic details and how to describe for geologists uh, the terrain of the ground, um, the topographic information that would be sensible to scientists who specialized in that field. And these were, these were pilots. They were specially selected for the program because they had the capacity not only to fly the module, to learn the engineering, to understand the craft, but also to absorb the science that they needed to, and how to communicate that science back to Earth. So that the scientists here, who had not flown to the moon, would be able to understand what they were seeing and, and get a sense of the topographical and geological features of the lunar surface. Um, so these were very skilled pilots who were then trained very intensively on how to describe things for scientists, um, which basically meant they had to learn science. Um, they really are some very, very amazing people. And then uh, Michael Collins, as we saw in the, um, in the description, the biography in The Finding Aid, he also went on to become uh, an undersecretary of state and to head the National Air and Space Museum. So quite the career that he had. Luminary 2 priority list. Lunar module, lunar surface position determination using AOT and gravity. PCR 698 question mark. Compensation of landing radar antenna rotation. DSKY display of radar data. Lateral ve velocity on downlink only if radar is modified. Back AOT detent positions in erasable. So this is part of the software section in here. Lots, lots of notes, lots of handwritten notes. PCR 646, option to confirm main lobe lock-on after R21. I don't know what all of that means, but
how to get a 15 degree dead band v21 n01 e 3255e 02525e v46e no idea what that means but the 15 percent or 15 degree dead band stuck out to me in that note um it just sounded interesting let's see what else do we have All right. Don't know for sure what's in here. I believe I opened this one just to get a sense and then just grabbed all the boxes because I had very, very little time to prepare for sharing this collection. Um, so this box, this is box 32. So I'll probably ref be referring to the finding aid here in a moment. Um, it has objects in it. Uh, two of them are marked as Distinguished Service Medals. Three of them are marked as Distinguished Service Medals. This one, though, I am uncertain what it is. This is the box. Um, you can see. Maybe you can see. I can go big and actually show you. The box. So it's a nice box. I haven't opened it yet, so not sure what's in it. We will see. Switch back to the document focus here. And I'm going to pull up the finding aid so that I can find out what's in it. Uh, box. 32. All right, box 32, we have a Distinguished Service Medal, Japanese Order of Culture. So I have a feeling that's what this one is, is the Japanese Order of Culture. Oh no. Do you all not have... Well, heck. I don't know what happened. I am trying to fix it. <laughs> Why did that happen? Oh. It's because things are not set up correctly and I switched to the right view, but the right view is the wrong... It, it, it's pointing to the wrong thing today. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we got it back. Um, I'm going to zoom out as much as I can there. Ooh! Thank you, Academian. Uh, the, Jap the, the award is given to people who contribute to Japan's art, literature, science, technology, or anything related to culture in general. So, oh, and it is labeled in here. Order of Culture Medal presented by Prime Minister Sato of Japan. Uh, for this, I am actually going to put gloves on. Because I'm going to touch the metal, but I don't want to touch the metal. <laughs> the, the ribbon in here has deteriorated a little over time, but the actual like enameled metal itself is very, very pretty. 
um, and has held up really nicely. The white enamel is still white. Um, oh, sorry. Let's see if I can... I can try an autofocus. Maybe. Ha, ah, yes. So the five-pointed flower here with the blue and the red and the white in the middle. It reminds me of a yin-yang, but it's got three. So I'm uncertain what that symbol is ca called. Um, there's... It looks like a laurel, but it is definitely not. I'm not sure what that is. Are those Asian pears? I would have to research to know exactly what they are, but it's it's quite nicely made. Um, it is tarnishing a little bit on the sides, but it is also fairly old. Uh, there's writing on the back, but unfortunately I do not read... Um, I do not read this script, so I don't know for sure what it says. Um, but it is, this is a very, very nice metal. And presumably awarded because he was, uh, because he went to space. Um, he did receive medals from various places, uh, Japan just being one of them. Oh, let me put the label back in here. That's one of the nicest, like, awards that I've ever seen as far as design and the actual, like, quality of the construction. It is, it is very pretty. Um, we have a NASA Distinguished Service Medal here. Zoom in if I can. Japan Report from 1968 VA Google Books. Yeah, there might be something somewhere in these papers that actually describes uh, the awarding of the medal and... Um, I would have to look at the finding aid to see if I could find that. So this is a Distinguished Service Medal from NASA. <clears throat> couple of them here. Pictures of them all getting the award and shaking hands with Sato in the Japan report. Honestly, these are all really nice awards. I never got awards this nice. They have some real design to them. I also never went to space, so... <laughs> I guess the award is commensurate with the level of service. Japan Report, volume uh, 15, number 21. I will see if I can... find that real quick. Although... Sharing it will be another challenge. <laughs> Volume 15, number 21. 
yeah, I'm not finding it right away, but that's okay. Uh, thank you for telling people where it is at, and if you all want to go, apparently there are scans of Japan Report number, or volume 15, number 21, um, in Google Books that includes some photographs related to the Japan, or the Japanese award there. Um, What else have we here? Can't get the box open. I'm now in box 33 of the Michael Collins papers. This is another box. <laughs> There's a box inside the box. It is a um, another box similar to the award box that we just opened. I'm going to zoom out. Um, this is very large. Woo! Things have moved around a little bit, but we have some medals here. The ribbon for his uniform. Get these where they actually belong. Ribbon. Is there anything else? All right. This one has. So this is the Order of the Magonghua Rose Azalea. Korea's high, highest civilian award, presented by President Park Chung-hee, Republic of Korea. <laughs> Academia, I am very, very happy that you're enjoying this. So the Order of Mugunghwa. And these are also, just really nice. Um, they're so weighty. I actually, before seeing, um, they reminded me a little bit of like German medals from pre World War One, but these are Korean. So this one has. This one's meant to be worn, kind of. Uh, like hanging around your neck, uh, attached to the ribbon that's included in the in the case. Um, this one is a pin that you can pierce through um, and actually just pin on. And then, of course, the ribbon here. Um, matches the military uniforms and the military style ribbons that people, uh, that the American uniform would have. Um, it's missing one piece. There's a little square hole here where um, we saw some smaller pins and such in some of the other cases. I'm assuming that is what belonged there, uh, but it is not present here. Some of these don't really get shown very often. So being able to do it on stream where they're not in a display case uh, with limited security, showing them on stream is a little bit easier. Whew. Box 34. I have a folder here that says Gemini 10 Rendezvous with Agena Target Vehicle Photo, July 1966. Why is it so... Oh, okay. This is actually like a photo print. Um, I'm going to keep the gloves on for a minute so I can take it out of the sleeve. It's a matte photo. It's actually like on cardboard of some sort. 
um, photograph of the Gemini rendezvousing with the Agena target vehicle. So, an actual photograph from space. Um, oh, it's still got too much light on it. It's actually much clearer than it looks on stream. There's, there's too much light reflecting off of it on stream for you. Uh, I can try and turn off the light. No, that doesn't really do much for it. But it's quite a nice, um, nice photograph there. Let's see what else is in this box. And while Michael Collins is probably best known for um, Apollo 11 and being the astronaut that stayed in space on the lunar orbiter, um, he did two spacewalks for Gemini 10. Apollo 11 ticker tape parade, New York City. August 13th, 1966. Let me rearrange things here a little bit. There we go. So we have some of the astronauts down in the car here. Dear Mike, although this comes a bit late, I know it will bring back happy remembrances of a great day. There's a handwritten signature in the middle of the ticker tape here. Uh, to Mike, with, oh, sorry, to Mike, Mike Collins, with happy memories, uh, of his welcome in New York City, John V. I think it says Lindbergh, but I'm not sure. And it doesn't say on the folder. Oh, Kira, the caption issue was probably me turning too far away and the computer mic not picking up my voice. I'm sorry, I will attempt to talk facing the computer so the captions continue working. <laughs> um, Zeus's Brothers, poem by Rod C. Tatter? Tater? Teeter. This is a very large document. It's a poem by Rod C. Teeter. <clears throat> Zeus's brothers. From space's dark deep hold, wait, <clears throat> from space's dark deep hold comes Apollo's glint of gold, steel and mold, flint and fire, from a power that's much higher comes the life of an astronaut destined to go where he ought. <clears throat> fire burn and fire die, into the heavens he does fly. With a million pounds of thrust, he blows away the age's dust. Unshackled free and tracking flame, he goes about his perilous game. Playing with the stars from birth, he thinks only of their worth. All their hearts go along with him as they see the burning gem. Fire and sun burn away his shame, Come and join, help him take aim. A soul's dark and dismal voice screams from within to make a choice. Take your heart and fly with him while millions sing for you a hymn. Shoot away and fly forever, for the earth again you may see never. Clutch your steed by the tether, lead him into space's shining dark heather. Pull tight upon his bit, spur him round and make him spit. Keep the fire inside him burning, and his star-born heart a-yearning. 
spin him round and make him fly into that mysterious black or bright black sky. Think what a meager life you now live, taking, taking, nothing to give. Rod D. Teeter. Thank you, Academian. Uh, John V. Lindsay, U.S. Congressman, and he was mayor of New York. And that name rings a bell now that you bring it up. Um, <laughs> sometimes with signatures, it's hard to tell, and that one was an, an L and not much else. So, Apollo 11, 10 year anniversary, 1979. We have a newspaper feature here from today. Um, I can't really zoom out much further on the document camera, so <clears throat> that's about as good as I can get. Uh, today being a periodical, the photograph of Stepping on the moon, Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. Apollo 11 patch with the eagle on it. I uh, actually need to take off the gloves while I'm handling this, because I don't want to uh, tear this paper. Hannah, your dad remembers being at church camp around a campfire listening to the radio when they landed on the moon. That is amazing. I don't have any, like, it was before my time, and I don't know what my parents' memories are of it. Um, I do remember stuff with the Challenger, though. I'm going to rotate this camera so that I can turn the page here. Um, and I do think it was the Challenger that, that got me interested in space personally. So this is a, a whole like feature in a periodical called Today. This is from 1979 and it is um, the 10 year anniversary of Apollo 11. Uh, you've got the mission photo or the photograph here Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and, and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, so Michael Collins here in the top, or in the center. Um, and if, if you go looking at the news today about um, Collins's death, uh, when I just Googled Michael Collins astronaut um, death or something like that, I, that's, I think, what the suggested search was from Google. Um, the first story that popped up was NPR, and it was titled, Forgotten Astronaut, Collins, uh, like, I don't remember the full title of the article, but it, it definitely started in quotation marks, Forgotten Astronaut, because people talk about Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin all the time, uh, Michael Collins was essential to that mission. Had it not been for him, they would not have been walking on the moon. New Newsday's magazine for Long Island, July 15th, 1979, Men on the Moon, a 10th anniversary report. So these are, this folder, or this box is slightly larger, which is why some of these items are here, because uh, they are larger items. Let's see what else is in here. Liftoff. Gallery proofs with revisions? Or galley proofs with revisions? Oh, that's stuff related to his book, I think. And I'm not going to pull that out individually at the moment. Let's see what else we have. Final galley proofs with comments on illustrations. Yeah. Let's see, let's see. What else? We 
to do some more photographs. Let's see if there's any Apollo 11 ones. Gemini 10, Gemini 10, Gemini 10, Gemini 10. Slides. Gemini 10 scrapbook. That sounds actually interesting. I know I said I was looking for Apollo 11 photos, but a scrapbook sounds interesting. And we also have a folder here called Gemini 10 Flug im Spiegel der Deutschen Presse. In Im Spiegel der Deutschen Presse. So clearly uh, some sort of German publication. Gemini 10 Flug im Spiegel der Deutschen Presse. which I do not know exactly what that translates to, something about the German press. We've got photocopies of articles from German newspapers about Apollo 11. Or no, Gemini 10, sorry. I read it out. It's Gemini 10, and then I said Apollo 11 anyway. Uh, can't turn the page. It's using some of the press images that we were looking at earlier. Okay. Let's pull out the scrapbook and take a look at it. Do not know. This just says Gemini 10 scrapbook, 1966. Oh, there we go. It's upside down. Gemini 10. Astros M. Collins J. Young. G. Twins, top Russians, 476 miles up. Because they set an orbital altitude record with the Gemini 10 mission. Uh, so this article is from Tuesday, July 19th, 1966 in the New York Post. From the Daily News, New York Daily News, July 21st, 1966. The headline, Mike zip guns to flying Agena, but fuel gap cuts trip short. First spacewalk between two vehicles. Let's see what this says. July 21st, 1966, first spacewalk between two vehicles. Uh, Houston, July 20th. Squirting about with a gas-powered zip gun, astronaut Mike Collins tonight dashed across the void from his Gemini 10 to the Agena 8 satellite in the first spacewalk between two vehicles. Collins retrieved a metal plate containing a scientific experiment from the side of Agena 8 uh, which has been circling the globe for four months, then whooshed back to the mothership and handed it to command pilot John Young. Mike went over there and picked up the S-10, the plate, Young told the ground. He picked it right off the Agena. But a critically low fuel supply aboard Gemini 10 forced flight controllers to have the scheduled hour-long extravehicular extra activity, EVA, the second for Collins in 25 hours. Come back in the house, Mike. Young ordered after Collins had spent about 25 minutes outside the capsule. Okay, replied Collins half-heartedly. Jettison the tether. 
Later, the astronauts opened the hatch again to jettison the spacewalk tether and other equipment no longer needed on the flight. Collins' stand-up EVA yesterday also was cut short by 15 minutes when strange odors wafted into the crewman's oxygen system, but they had no trouble with it during today's EVA. The EVA cut back forced Collins to toss away a second S-12 plate, which he was to have affixed to the Agena's side. This was to have been retrieved by Apollo 12, or by Gemini 12 pilot Buzz Aldrin late this year. Collins reported also that he was sorry to say that he had lost a camera he was carrying, which was what, which was to have been used to take pictures of the, de of the dead Agena, the Earth, and the stars. The camera drifted away out of reach. The stable Agena allowed Young to inch his Gemini right up next to the unmanned vehicle. Flight plans called for him to draw within five feet of the Agena, but the crewman, crewman didn't say how close they actually got. Solid as a rock, Collins said when he spied the stable Agena uh, before the EVA, which started over Western Australia. Uh, Young had jockeyed Gemini 10 onto a rendezvous with the old Agena after undocking from Agena 10 and letting it drift. The Gemini 10 crew caught up with them, caught up with the powerless Agena in the second act of the world's first dual rendezvous after a two-day space chase spanning 850,000 miles. Agena 10 drifted in space 22 miles from the other spacecraft as Collins hopped out for his EVA. Collins was linked to the mothership by a nylon tether that permitted him to swing as far as 40 feet away from Gemini 10. An oxygen hose and a line pumping nitrogen propellant gas into his handheld maneuvering unit, HHMU, also were hooked to the spacecraft. We've got a photograph of the Gemini 10 Prime crew. Astronauts John W. Young and Michael Collins. That's a nice photograph. In color, the two of them. Someone will eventually find that camera if it didn't re-enter atmosphere. Yes, that is true. Although there's a lot of space debris up there now. So it's probably run into something and, and been damaged by now. Gemini pair get the go-go for Collins' space dance in space, or Collins' dance in space. Just throw in space a few extra times in, into the, the words. <laughs> um, I don't know what my, the, the angles on my camera are just really off today, and I'm very sorry about that. Gemini docks with Agena, then starts a maneuver to blast into new orbit. Gem twins latch on to Agena target. This photograph here. Spaceman John Young holds huge pair of fake pliers presented to him for space flight. Michael Collins, right, got giant monkey wrench as part of the gag. Astronaut Donald K. Deke Slayton, left, chief trainer for Gemini Twins, looks on at Cape Kennedy. Oxygen trouble halts space stunt. Really? The New York Daily News captioned this photograph, Mike Collins, eyes fill with tears. He doesn't appear to be crying in the photograph, though. <laughs> but it is also the New York Daily News, so you have to consider your source. Gemini flight ends with splashdown three miles from target. After splashdown, while Major Collins settles into raft, Navy Frogman helps Commander Young from capsule. Triumph, the Triumph of Gemini 10. 
zoom in a little bit so that I can try and read this while facing the camera instead of not. Um, The flight of Gemini 10 was probably the most productive and most important manned experiment in space to date. It demonstrated that a genuine quantum jump has been accomplished in man's capabilities in that strange and deeply hostile realm beyond Earth's atmosphere. It will require the work of generations to realize the full potentials of man's new abilities that were first exercised these past few days. A new era began when astronaut Michael Collins went from Gemini 10 to the Agena 8 rocket, parked in space for months, and recovered a scientific instrument for return to Earth. This was useful work conducted on another vehicle by a man outside the protective cocoon of the capsule that had taken him into space. It is clear what this feat portends. In the years immediately ahead, men working in space will put huge structures together, joining vehicles and parts that were rocketed separately and even at widely separated intervals. Other men will assume the task of space inspectors, physically approaching suspicious satellites and using direct vision to see whether such bodies are being employed for espionage purposes or contain forbidden weapons. Looking, further, looking still further ahead, men will physically transfer themselves from orbiting body to orbiting body as routinely as sailors now go from one ship at sea to another. Adding to these perspectives, of course, is the demonstration given in the first stage of Gemini 10 of other important capabilities. For about a day and a half, the vehicle, the vehicle containing astronauts Young and Collins was docked with the Agena 10 satellite and employed the, latter ro the latter's rocket power to move about in space, this feat alone would have made this flight of historic importance since it opens breathtaking new possibilities in both the economics and technology of tomorrow's space travel. What Gemini 10 has shown above all is that the capability is now available for activities in space that even yesterday seemed only the stuff of science fiction. Orbiting scientific laboratories periodically su supplied from Earth by Space Tug can be put up now whenever it is desired to do so. The same is true, of course, of an orbiting military base. The technology, in short, is neutral. Men must decide whether their new abilities shall be used for good or for evil. It was encouraging news yesterday, therefore, that only hours before the pre precision landing of Gemini 10 on the Atlantic Ocean, or in the Atlantic Ocean, Soviet and American diplomats in Geneva reached their first major agreements on the contents of a new international space treaty. If the negotiators in Geneva had had any doubts about the matter, the exploits of Young and Collins should be persuasive that the diplomats cannot afford to dawdle. So, while it gets overshadowed by Apollo 11, uh, just a few years later, Gemini 10 was a big deal at the time. <laughs> Astronauts back at the Cape reporting Columbus was right. History's highest flying spacemen returned to their launch site today to, to report on the spectacular success of Gemini 10 and jokingly told a cheering crowd, Columbus was right. The world is round. And here we can see um, we've got John Young and Michael Collins. You can see the, the mission patch on John Young's uh, jacket there for the Gemini 10. Um, over here in the corner, though, is the, the first time in all of the documents we've looked at today, all of the pictures, everything we've looked at today, it's the first time we have Patricia Collins, his wife, and their children. So that was seeing that there in the scrapbook. I thought I would highlight that 
we've got wife and children there as well. Uh, we'll stick this photo in here for now because I like this photo. Um, we are getting toward the end of the stream for today, which is most of why I decided to just throw up a photo. Um, I'm going to leave that there for the moment, maybe. There. It doesn't slide if I do that way. All right. So this has been Archival Adventures for this week. Um, it certainly was an adventure for me. Uh, last minute change a half hour before stream started to uh, focus on Michael Collins. Um, hopefully it was interesting for you. Hopefully you learned a little bit about Michael Collins, the Gemini 10 mission, Apollo 11. Um, honestly, any of the astronauts involved in the Gemini or Apollo missions are very interesting people, very worth uh, learning about. Um, I know there was a PBS um, documentary that came out, I want to say, last year, but my brain... No, 2019. 2019. Uh, because it came out for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. Um, they had a series of, like a documentary series that covered all of the Apollo missions. Um, highly recommend that if you're at all interested in the topic. It is well worth a watch. Um, should be available from your local PBS station. Um, so, honestly, this has been one of the more interesting archival adventures for me. Um, partly just because I find all of this really interesting, and even though we didn't really get into technical manuals uh, and other things you can see here, I've got an entire cart of boxes um, for this collection, uh, and we didn't get into... We barely scratched the surface of what is contained in this collection. Um, it has been a thrill for me to, to look through this material on stream with you all. Uh, next week, we will be looking at the Hokie Pride records. Um, Hokie Pride, as I mentioned, is the uh, Virginia Tech LGBTQ plus uh, student organization. Um, let me pull up real quick their, the description <laughs> that I wrote when I wrote the finding aid for them. Uh, And I'll just tell you just a little bit about them. Historical note. Uh, Hokie Pride was originally founded in 1985 as Lambda Horizons, sometimes lit written as Lambda Horizon. In 1994, the group was renamed the Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Alliance. Then in 1999, the name was changed again to the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Alliance. In 2014, the name changed once more to the current name, Hokie Pride. It was the second officially recognized LGBTQIA plus student group formed at Virginia Tech following the Gay Alliance at Virginia Tech in 1971. It also followed three unofficial groups, the Gay Liberation Front in 1970, the Gay Student Union in 1975, and the Gay Student Alliance in 1976. Early goals included providing a place on campus for gay and lesbian members of the university community to meet without judgment, helping educate the campus community about homosexuality, and creating a positive image of gay and lesbian people. So we do have uh, the records of Hokie Pride um, spanning their entire time be in being up through 2015. Um, so we will be looking at those next week on Archival Adventures here um, at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Hannah, thank you for the 100 bits. Um, gonna go ahead and set up a raid uh, and I'm hoping, hoping that we can do, let's see, I don't know who's gonna be live. Hmm. Who should we raid today, y'all? I like to do the Monterey Bay Aquarium because I can do that one from both both channels, um, but it doesn't look like they are on right now. So we may end up doing a split raid because I can't raid North Carolina State University from my personal account. Uh, 
let's see. Who's doing the educational category? Or if anybody has a suggestion, I'm open to suggestions. Kira, if you've got a thought, let me know. Yeah. Um, dude. All right. Well, I'm going to set it up. We will go ahead and pop in on NCSU Libraries from the VTUL Studios channel. So everybody at VTUL Studios, go on over, say hello to the North Carolina State University Libraries for me. Um, and from my channel, we will go say hello to Stephen Kill. Uh, Stephen Kill is currently playing Hollow Knight. Uh, they are a lovely stre Irish streamer um, based out of Scotland. Uh, they have a number of librarians that actually watch their streams, um, and they their streams are a good time. So um, say hello to Stephen Kill for me when you get over there. Um, I hope to see you again next week at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time Wednesday for um, more archival adventures, and thank you everybody for stopping by.